at this point in time, I'd like to introduce uh, Pamela Flores from the National Park Service who will kick off the ceremony. Thank you. Definitely is a hard uh, act to follow after Jim, but uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this special ceremony to honor the USS Arizona crew. And, oh, I'm sorry, oh my goodness. You can definitely tell I've been to a lot of ceremonies in <laughs> the USS Utah. And the crew members, very important crew members, Hall, Harry Halstead and Clark Simmons. My name is Pamela Flores, and on behalf of the National Park Service, welcome. Uh, I extend a special aloha and greetings to our uh, today's speakers, and also along with our very distinguished guests. We have USS Utah survivor Gil Meyer. We have USS Pennsylvania survivor Dalton Wallen. And we have uh, a Pearl Harbor survivor, John Matrus. Thank you for taking that journey to be here with us today. We are honored. We also have Mary Cray and her daughter, Nina. We have, we have the family of Harry Hostet. the family of Clark Simmons, flag and general officers, elected and appointed officials, business and community leaders, welcome. For guests in under our tent seating, the chairs and tent is available for you during the ceremony, but if at any point you find that you would like to stand to get closer or be able to see the ceremony better, you are more than welcome to move around. At this time, we will hear opening remarks from our superintendent of the National Park, World War II, Valor in the Pacific, National Monument, Jacqueline Ashwell. Good evening, everyone, and aloha. Welcome to our survivors, families, everyone gathered here tonight. It's an honor to be here with all of you on the eve of the 76th commemoration of Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day. Each year we gather here to honor the 58 sailors who lost their lives when the USS Utah was hit by two Japanese torpedoes, one of the first ships to go down in Pearl Harbor on that day. We remember the valor of men such as Chief Water Tender Peter Tomlick, who when he realized that the ship was capsizing, he did not run for safety, but he instead realized that he needed to stay at his post because if he could stabilize the boilers, a lot of people would be able to escape with their lives. And so he stayed and he allowed for others to go on to fill long lives, but he ran out of time. He and 57 other men ran out of time. And so each year we gather to remember their sacrifice. Today is particularly special. Today we celebrate two additional lives. Two men who were fortunate to escape the capsizing of the ship that you see behind me thanks to the teamwork of Tomlick and other shipmates. Clark Simmons was a cook. When he voluntarily enlisted before the war, before the United States had been drug into this conflict, there were no positions, really, for a black man at that time. He said that all one could really do back then was be a porter or shine shoes, make beds, serve meals to the officers, and he chose to be a cook. He was interviewed um, last year, there's a video on YouTube, you can go check out, 
You can see his smile and hear his words. And the opening question of the interview is, you were on the ship that day. What did you do when the torpedoes hit? And he thought about it for a second, and he smiled, and then he said, I swam like hell to get off. <laughs> he was no fool, and he was not alone. Harry Hostat was below decks when the ship was attacked. He was able to escape as well, and he joined Clark Simmons and many other shipmates who swam for shore as the war began around them. I know that uh, Jim Taylor is planning to tell you a lot more about these men. And so I will leave that honor to him and not step on his remarks, hopefully any more than I have already, right? Okay. But before I do, I want to honor the man who does the honors. The man who has for 20 years been here steadfast to honor all of those who choose to return to Pearl Harbor when they die. Jim Taylor's been here. He has taken the lead to ensure that the USS Utah is not a forgotten ship. Jim, it's an honor to know you. You're an inspiration. The employees of the U.S. National Park Service have enjoyed partnering with you over all these years, and we've learned a great deal from you as well. We will continue in this partnership to ensure that the USS Utah is never a forgotten ship. That is our promise. It is our vow. The flag that flies today over the USS Utah will remain at half-staff tomorrow by order of the President of the United States of America in honor of Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day. And on Friday, Chris, you're here? I saw him earlier. He's around here somewhere. When Chris goes out on Friday, instead of raising this flag back to full staff, I want him to take that flag and retire it from service because I want to give today's flag to Jim Taylor as a gift of our gratitude and for all the work that he has done for so many years for so many. Thank you. You know, one of the things that I always find particularly touching or there's no word for it really, when I'm here at this memorial and next to this ship is all the souls that are here with us. The men of the Utah, men like Clark Simmons and Harry Hostat, but also all of those who survived countless other dangers, but were faced with the decision and decided to return here. Their ashes are here. They're mixed together by the current, mixed with the sediment of the harbor, forever becoming a part of one another and a part of this place. Thank you for being here this evening with us to honor the men of the USS Utah, to honor the countless others who rest here, who served their country with distinction and honor, and to celebrate the lives of Clark Simmons and Harry Hostat. Thank you for joining us. It is now my extreme honor and privilege to introduce Jim Taylor. And I have a little bit of a bio that I was just given. You guys want to hear the bio? Okay, because he's, yeah, let's do this.
All right. <clears throat> Master Chief Taylor enlisted in the U.S. Navy in October 1956 in his hometown of Toledo, Ohio. After recruit training, he was temporarily assigned to Public Affairs, 12th Naval District, then attended Yeoman Class A School in Long Beach, California. Upon completion of the school, he was assigned to the USS Herbert J. Thomas, DDR-833, and did one deployment, which included his successful crossing of the equator and becoming a shellback. After a tour there, he was sent to U.S. Naval Station Sangley Point in the Philippines, where he was on permanent shore patrol. There he met his wife, Nora. They've been together for 56 years. He then received orders to the USS Higby, DDR-806. Jim was then transferred to the Naval Reserve Training Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Follow-on assignments were at Commander Fleet Air Hawaii at Barbers Point, Hawaii U.S. Proteus, AS-19, on Guam, pre-commissioning detail at Naval Facility Barbers Point, USS Robert E. Perry, FF-1073 at Pearl Harbor, and Commander Patrol Wing 2 as Command Senior Chief. He was then selected to attend the Navy's then new Senior Enlisted Academy, where he assisted in writing the original curriculum for the school. After C, he went to the Navy Support Office in Italy, then to the Intelligence Center Pacific at Camp Smith, both in CMC positions. Jim closed out his Navy career as Command Master Chief, Patrol Squadron 22 at Barber's Point retiring July 1st, 1989. His military decorations include the Meritorious Service Medal, Joint Service Commendation Medal, Navy Commendation Medal, Navy Achievement Medal, Good Conduct Medal, eight awards, and various unit citations. Jim continued to serve our country as a civilian for 18 years as the assistant officer in charge of the Naval Brig Pearl Harbor. For the past eight years, he's been a volunteer coordinating events for our Pearl Harbor survivors. Please give a warm welcome to Jim Taylor. I'm the only one that's supposed to give surprises. Uh, thank you. That's all I can say. I've loved what I've been doing. Uh, are you volunteer five days a week, eight hours a day? Well, sometimes Saturday and Sunday, too. <laughs> but, you know, the Pearl Harbor survivors and their families, um, they very are very, very important to me. Um, huh. She stole all my marks, too. She, uh, when the attack started on the morning of December 7th, 6th, 7th, today's the 6th, the Utah was about twice, about twice as far out as it is now. Um, those people had to swim all the way from out there to land, which was about where the houses begin back there, all the time being strafed by the Japanese aircraft. It was in America that a lot of them survived, and nobody really knows if and how many died swimming back. Um, it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a real chore. Uh, most of them were transferred to other ships uh, a few days after the attack. Um, some of them, we have two, two corpsmen, medicals, medics, that uh, 
were sent over to the medical clinic here. We put their ashes in the harbor here two years ago. The, the Utah really, you know, they didn't, didn't go out and kill people. What they did was they, they, they and then did a good job doing it, they trained people to kill people. And uh, the Utah was a training ship that trained our pilots with dropping bombs, and they trained our gunners to fire the guns. I said this jokingly, but it's kind of serious. Uh, I don't know where I dreamed this up last year, but I'm going to say it again. In my opinion, the USS Utah won the war. The people that they trained were the ones that won the Battle of Midway, shooting down Japanese aircraft. And um, they, they were part of the war, although they were not active. I've had many friends she did steal most of my lines that I'm not I'm, I'm not going to repeat, and this microphone isn't helping me at all. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit having trouble talking right now because of the things that Jacqueline said. Um, I, I, uh, I just thank everybody that's here tonight, uh, a good number. Tonight you're going to see the uh, two of our uh, past Utah survivors honored, uh, Petty Officer Hostat, who was a first class Petty Officer when he left the Navy. He was down below decks, and a little story that he had. He climbed up the ladder, and as he was climbing up the ladder, the guy up above him dropped his shoe, said, somebody give him my shoe. So somebody got him a shoe, started up back up the ladder again, dropped his shoe again, told Harry, Harry, get my shoe. He says, the hell with your shoe. Get off this ship. So, <laughs> so needless to say, the shoe is still inside the ship. Uh, Clark Simmons, a very good friend of mine, a uh, good friend of everybody. Um, USS Utah survivor who I don't think ever missed a, a, a reunion. I think he was at every one of them. He helped out the survivors, family, uh, a wonderful guy. Due to family issues, there's a little mix-up on his uh, – his burial, and so what we have here is we have his very valuable um, keepsakes that his, his loving daughter came. Claudette, I, you're a wonder. I just I, it's it's wonderful that you could bring him here. Going back to Harry Hostat. Um, he, once again, was up for first class, and he made it. They were heroes. Now, everybody, all the Pearl Harbor survivors and everybody that I met, including this one over here, they say, I'm not a hero. I bet you said that. They all say, I was just doing my job. I bet you said that, too. I don't believe it. They were heroes. They set the mold during World War II that our military personnel today are using, that of World War II, and they won the war. That's W-O-N. That hasn't happened since, I don't believe. But my hat's off to you, even though I don't have one on. And you, Gil, um, Dalton, Wally, better known as Wally, he was, he was in the tower during the attack, watching the Japanese fly under him. 
that's got to be kind of scary. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over to the uh, United States Navy Ceremonial Guard. Ceremonial Guard, post. So we have gathered here as family and friends and shipmates and grateful Americans. We have gathered here in this memorial site in loving memory of First Class Petty Officer Harry Hostat and Lieut Lieutenant Commander Clark Simmons. For although they are departed from this world, they live on in our hearts and in our fond memories. As people of faith, we can take comfort in the belief that God cares for us in good times and bad throughout our lives and has prepared a place for us in heaven. In 1 John 14, 1 through 6, uh, Jesus comforts his disciples with these words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare that place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So in times like this, although we will still experience grief and sadness, we can also take comfort in the belief that God is with us, and he has received our loved ones into his heavenly kingdom and will send his comforter to be with us in our sorrows. In 23rd Psalm, we read, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God has created us as spiritual beings to live in a season in our human forms, but God has also created us to live on in spiritual form forever. Christ has overcome death in his resurrection, and through Christ we also will become victorious over death. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, I pray that your spirit will rest upon these families and all those who have gathered here this evening, may your blessings be upon them and your comforter be with them to bring your peace, giving them the reassurance of your love for them in their times of sorrow. We have gathered here at the USS Utah Memorial in loving memory of First Class Petty Officer Harry T. Hostat and Lieutenant Commander Clark Simmons. They will be missed by all those who knew them and although they are no longer with us in body, they live on in our memories, and we can take comfort in the belief that their spirits live in heaven as we trust in your promises of eternal life. So may we always abide in your peace, living in the hope that through your grace we will live on forever in, in your heavenly kingdom. For it is in your most holy name that I pray. Amen.
Racing pad. Take. Forward. March. I read the names of the people, sailors, who we have placed inside the ship. They survived the attack, they survived a good life, and we honored them by bringing them back here. Robert Boykin, Robert Johnson, Carl Johnson. Guy Pierce, Thomas Mole, John Jones, Jean Seltzer, James Oberto, Lee Susi, Gordon Sumner, Theodore Roosevelt. Cecil Caliban, Clark Simmons, Harry Hostaff. Hello to them, aloha to them all. The chaplain will now give a benediction. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, I pray that your spirit will rest upon this ohana and all those who have gathered here this evening. May your blessings be upon them, and may your comforter bring us peace and give us reassurance of your love. As we bring Harry Hostat and Clark Simmons to their final resting place here on earth, we pray for your blessing and peace upon all those who rest here. For Harry and Clark remains will now rest alongside of their former shipmates, even as their spirits are reunited in heaven. So we pray that you bring 
Harry, as, as we bring Harry to his final resting place, we consecrate this place with our prayers and with our tears. But we rejoice in the knowledge to know that your Holy Spirit, we will someday be reunited with our loved ones in heaven as well. For it is your most holy name I pray. Amen. <laughs>